the ongoing, very, very intense work we have in Sweden with increasing the proportion of women primarily in certain second sectors of society, not so much um, increasing the proportion of, of men, actually, which is quite interesting. So I was going to say some things about this, but other speakers have covered that so, so well that I don't have to um, go into this very much. But there is a connection, I would argue, that's pretty obvious between forcing people to do things um, and health, uh, as the Harry's reports show, job satisfaction is very important for males. And um, there are some things to note about these concepts. It's very hard to measure opportunity, equal opportunities. So how would you know that there are, in fact, equal opportunities, especially if there is, in fact, some real difference between, in this case, uh, the sexes? And, of course, if you have equal opportunities, it allows for inequality to um, have its reign. But it, the good thing is that it's kind of natural. No one has to take responsibility for certain decisions. It implies the freedom of choice and so forth. When it comes to equal outcomes, they're amazingly simple to measure, which is good for politicians who look at data on the, on the national or global level. And uh, they are interesting from a... Uh, equality perspective because they are related to power and influence and so forth. Uh, one problem you can uh, point out is that it's kind of utopian. If you take on the task of deciding what is a good outcome for a group or for an individual, you wouldn't do that for an individual to begin with, but if you do that on the group basis, you are taking on a great deal of responsibility for what do you know, really. Um, can you be sure that in the long run the uh, the effects are beneficial. And this is an example just from this week, Tuesday. Um, the uh, Technical University in Eindhoven decided to only hire females uh, staff for um, a, a number of years. So let's delve directly into the issue of psychological sex differences because, of course, if there aren't any real biologically predetermined at birth uh, sex differences, we would expect the outcomes to be identical if the uh, opportunities are identical. Uh, on the other hand, if there are such differences, we would have to in intervene to make the outcomes uh, similar, like nudging, social engineering. Um, actually, a lot of things that we wouldn't really endorse on the individual level because we know that we are all, as individuals, quite different and it would be quite harmful to say that you're not allowed to do this and you have to do that. But somehow um, politicians think, in Scandinavia at least, that that is a good idea. It's a very important task. They devote huge resources to that. So there are many hundreds of studies I could mention um, that show sex differences in brain structure, spatial ability, memory, and, and what not, you name it. There's, but in the interest of time, let me just focus on one simple construct that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the Big Five uh, personality inventory, which has, as the name implies, five main dimensions and 30 uh, so-called facets, 30 different aspects of personality. And if we were to uh, plot these um, as means for two groups um, of people, it would look something like this. So the red polygon is for females, and you will see that the axis, so in the periphery, we have positive values, higher levels of these uh, personality traits. And in the center, there are lower values. And you see that females have more of everything in terms of psychology, basically. They are warmer, kinder, more conscientious, more um, agreeable, and, and also more worrisome in terms of neuroticism, which makes the male polygon smaller than the red one. But there's another more important thing about this, and that is that they have different shapes. So there's actually a, a kind of pattern. Things tend to go together. Uh, for, for males, uh, low neuroticism tends to go together with low conscientiousness and low agreeableness and so forth. So there, there is a sex-specific pattern. So let me just to... I'm not sure if I'm, this is difficult to 
perhaps convey, but let me just give you an analogy. We know that men and women have equal body height, and we are perfectly comfortable with saying that males are on average uh, taller than women. Uh, whereas when it comes to psychological properties, we are damned if we say that men are on average anything less or more than, than females because you would hear the outcry that, oh, but the variability within each group, within each six, is so huge that you cannot possibly speak of any group difference. But nevertheless, uh, height, body height, is one of the largest sex differences with an effect size of 1.9, which means that if you were to judge an individual only from height and predict that person's sex, you would be incorrect in only 34% of the cases. But that is quite high. But, of course, that is not what we do, because we know more, more. If we see a person coming towards us, we will see these measures, as I tried to <clears throat> outline here, certain proportions between anthropomorphic measures, and if we use all of that information, which creates, of course, a pattern, like the pattern in, in um, personality, we will be incorrect only in about 2% of the cases. So apparently this is uh, important information. And I would just like to give you an example of the forces, the powers that be, that don't really like the issue of sex difference, how they treat that in academe. This is an example, of, I'm sure you've heard of this very famous, the gender similarity hypothesis, that there are essentially no differences. So let me illustrate that with this uh, depiction of the big five with all its facets. <clears throat> so we can see from this pattern, we have the means for each dimension to the far left with the error bars, and then we have the means for each facet. And as you can see to the far right, Women are pretty much constantly higher in neuroticism than are males because what you see on the y-axis is the female minus the male score or mean value. And the same is true of agreeableness. It doesn't vary that much. But there are dramatic things happening within the traits or dimensions of extroversion and openness to experience. But as these facets tend to go together on the individual level, we usually aggregate across them and makes it look, make it look like this. Um, but apparently it does not, they do not tend to go together uh, on the level of sex differences because they are so dramatic, some of them. But nevertheless, um, Janet Hyde's uh, article does just that. It ignores these differences by routinely aggregating across the facets but it does something more to that as well. It also aggregates across all personality traits. Uh, apparently the logic is that these are five different ways of measuring the same thing, namely personality or uh, personality sex differences. So we just aggregate them and we end up with an effect size of uh, a mere 0.14 standard deviations. And you can, you can therefore conclude that the uh, difference is, is minimal and not very important. But there's a totally different way of doing that, uh, exploiting the pattern that actually exists in the data. So this is the, these are the data that you saw in the previous picture. It's only that I bent it like a donut like this so that we more clearly see the pattern of the sex differences in all the facets of the NEO-P uh, personality instrument. And if we use all of that information and create a so-called multivariate effect size, it becomes very much bigger. And Marco del Guidici was, I think, the first to, to, to test that model. And he arrived and his uh, colleagues at an effect size of 2.7, which is, I mean, huge. It's almost not heard about for any psychological or human trait whatsoever, 2.7. That was using the latent variables. And they compare this in their article with the normal mean univariate effect size. They use a different instrument than the big five, an instrument that is more sensitive, but it doesn't really matter. The point is clear that if you use the mean aggregation, the overall effect size becomes very, very much smaller, like 10 times smaller than the multivariate effect size. So this indicates that there is, in fact, 
there are in fact psychological uh, mean differences. Just, just to compare with body height, uh, with a, an effect size of 1.9, this is what the overlap of the distributions look like. And for Delgridic's uh, effect size, it's even smaller, it's an overlap of only 18%. So there, most women are different from most men in this overall masculine, if masculinity, femininity index of personality. Of course, you would say that, sure, but this is not important because it's all learned. It's all, all socially conditioned. And I just want to point out without going into any details that there is a whole toolbox for um, di di discriminating between environmental hypotheses and other kinds of hypotheses. And I just want to briefly go through some of the uh, tools that we can use. We can, if, if differences, any group difference, is found early in life, it's probably uh, biologically determined. The same is true if it's universal across cultures, uh, across historical time and so forth, across different conditions like different polities in different countries and, and so forth. And you can also exploit a uh, number of biological determinants, uh, determinants, hormones, natural variation across individuals like in the menstrual cycle, um, compare children with adults, but in specifically the pubertal change, we can observe the Tanner stages and see if they correlate more strongly with a certain psychological trait than uh, if you do not consider the uh, pubertal developmental stage and so forth. You can see for yourself, I'm, I will move on in the interest of time. Um, finally, there are genetic associations that also, none of these are totally determined will totally determine that there, is, um, it, that there is a biological effect. There can be different confounding variables and so forth, but they certainly increase the likelihood of such effects. So just to provide a very, very few examples of this classical study by Richard Lippa, looking at, again, uh, the well, personality traits across 53 nations. The blue bar is what you would expect if there were no sex differences at all. And the only interesting thing is the, the thing here at the bottom, which shows the effect size. Uh, ignore the, the, the stuff at the top. But at least we see that women are about one and a half standard deviation um, more what? Uh, agreeable, more agreeable. And uh, somewhat less, uh, more uh, neuroticism, uh, uh, lower in, sorry, somewhat less, more higher in neuroticism than males. Those are just two examples showing that the uh, sex difference is in fact consistent. Otherwise you would expect that with all of our variations there are across nations, surely some nation would show the opposite pattern where the females are higher in, um, lower in neuroticism. And just to take quickly a few examples of this uh, puberty thing, if we look at personality again, um, we see that there's very little difference, a smaller difference in childhood. It suddenly increases at puberty around 13 to 15 years of age and continues to be large throughout life. Same is true of extroversion and rather big for neuroticism, where also the sexes start at the same level, at 10 years of age, and so forth. So just an example of early changes in childhood. This is a study at six months of age, showing preferences, looking preferences at, at infants for different kinds of toys. Of course, it could be somehow learned, but it tends to be less likely when they are so young. Um, finally, a study which just an example looking at both hormones and some genetic um, analysis. We did uh, a replication of Delgridic's multivariate effect size for a set of twins. And what we found was about 1.1 standard deviations differences in masculinity, femininity, which is very, very large. Um, but we also could determine that the heritability of this specific trait, which is a, that is a trait that was created uh, from this particular data set, was about 
0.33. That is a bit smaller than usually found for personality, which tends to lie around 0.4, 0.5, the heritability of personality. Uh, perhaps the most interesting result is that the female twin of twin pairs, different sex twin pairs, uh, had higher masculinity scores than females who had a female co-twin, which is we attribute to the fact that testosterone um, dissipates to the co-twin and presumably makes it more uh, masculine, even though it is girl in this case. Now, by just bombarding you with all this biological stuff, I'm not by any, in any way saying that the environment or the social factors don't matter at all. Absolutely not. They are extremely important. The simple point is just that if there are group differences that are somehow with us from birth and continue throughout life, um, they have important implications and consequences. And uh, speci specifically for what one could and should try to change. So, given that we believe that there are these sex differences, what would they imply for um, po policies like um, equality policies? I did a, in Sweden, the background is that we've had attempts to legislate um, quotas for company board members, uh, which failed twice. And uh, we have 40 years of experience with the government working to Im improve the equality, particularly in high status jobs like in the academe. And so there, there's a lot of text written about this by politicians at the higher levels. Yeah. So I um, analyzed this, those, some of those texts that I could find with the content analysis and tried to find out what the arguments were. So, as a summary, um, we skip that. The themes that were most important, I found 10 different messages, but we don't care about all of those. Uh, we'll only care about these that you see here. Women are at least as able as men, but less able men are um, favored in the selection processes. And we have to increase the proportion of women to at least 40%, and we have to do that with quotas. Now, the funny thing is that if women are, in fact, more able than men, if they have higher merits, it would be a better thing to improve the meritocratic selection system because thereby you would more, uh, more correctly select the most able women amongst the women, at least. If you have a quota system, you cannot be so sure if the meritocratic assessment is poor. So this is my conclusion of this study, which was published in uh, Frontiers in Communication, that these arguments are internally inconsistent. Uh, you can read the paper if you're interested. Uh, I'll skip that too and point out something very interesting that connects to what Tanya and also Geisbert told us. Uh, Falk and Hermley, they uh, t took it on themselves to test the two contrasting hypotheses that more freedom of choice would, as according to Swedish politicians, lead to more equal outcomes, and contrasted that with the resource hypothesis, which is based on the assumption that there are some, some inborn differences that get more, um, that have more room to play out in a richer society when we have more freedom of choice because we have a welfare system. We don't have to be so anxious about how to, um, <clears throat> to get our subsistence and so forth. And this is what they found. Looking at six different, we don't have to bother about what these preferences, as they call them, are to the left. But the important take-home message from this picture is that whichever six sex differences we look at, they increase with the gender equality index of countries that you see along the x-axis. So it goes totally against the social conditioning hypothesis, or what they call it. And so this is a very good study published in, in Science and Everything, which surprised me because of the message. And um, it also is true of, because 
we don't really know what is driving this. Is it gender equality or is it GDP or economic progress? Because they are tightly linked uh, across countries in the world. And, and here is, you might say that these are only attitudes. What about real behavior, actual choices? There is a study that you see here that looked at choices in graduate um, education. And for the humanities and social sciences that you see in this graph, the blue band would be equal uh, numbers of men and women. But in fact, many more women studied the social sciences. But the important thing here is that along the x-axis, you see the GDP per capita, and the sex difference, or the overrepresentation of females, in other words, increases with the GDP. And the same is uh, true for health and uh, caring sciences. And we see the same tendency for engineering, where you have a small sex differences in countries with lower economic development, and fewer and fewer women tend to study engineering as the GDP increases, which again goes totally against the social conditioning hypothesis. So um, having said that, and moving quickly on, thank you, one minute, that's wonderful. There, there are many examples of occupation. So we have this idea about the patriarchy and the striving of, of power and, and uh, money and so forth. Here are just a few examples of cases that doesn't fit that model. I have never seen in my whole life that up in the right corner. I hope you have. Uh, but it must be 99% at least of uh, auto engineers, uh, mechanics that are men. And Another interesting example is veterinarians. Veterinarians have a long education. It's a high social status job. It's very well paid. And yet, there's a total massive dominance of, of women in Sweden, at least in the younger cohorts between 20 and 35 years of age. And um, so I think the, what these data suggest is that as the GDP and the welfare systems will develop in other countries than the West, um, we would expect to see the same development there, that the sex differences in behavior, in preferences, in interest, they will increase. And at the same time, will the demand for sex equality also increase, paradoxically, which will uh, lead to an unresolvable conflict that we are dealing with here now, but that other countries will soon be dealing with in the world today. And, I, and the only solution, I think, the, I mean, one thing, the point we are at now is that we are rapidly collecting more and more data uh, that, to inform us about real biological sex differences. But if people are not willing to hear that message, there will be um, you know, um, war about facts, there will be a lot of bickering and arguing, and we will probably never get anywhere with regards to the policies that, have to be, that politicians want to put in. So um, a totally different alternative is to say, well, look, we've actually shown that, yes, there are some differences. We cannot say how much they affect the outcomes, because that is obviously extremely difficult to do. But it's enough that they exist and that they do affect um, outcomes between men and women. Therefore, you should not mess with the outcomes. Just don't bother about it. Let the chips fall as they fall. Thank you.